Well, all that Jesus did and continues to do has the end goal of making our joy complete. A joy that's untouchable. A joy that cannot be duplicated. A joy that will never fade, decay, or run out. The joy that Jesus brings is everlasting and guarded by the very hand of God through the Holy Spirit. Yet many search and search for that which they think gives joy, confusing joy with this distant relative and ever-fragile happiness. They long for that perfect job or income that will allow them to acquire stuff to their heart's content. They strive and strive for things because it is through them that they believe that they can find joy. But in the end, it's only a fleeting happiness. Too many people think worldly happiness is the end game. But sadly, they find this to be an endless pursuit with death waiting at the end. What Jesus did was to give us access to God because in our sinful state we were cut off from God, thus no true joy. With access to God, true joy is found. And so we seek the heart of Jesus to want what he wants. He wanted God. And so, let us follow suit. I mean, after all, I think Jesus was onto something, don't you think? Let's pray. Holy God, what a joy it is to gather as your children, as you have sent your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see the truth. May you continue to draw us closer and closer that our joy may be more and more full. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Well, verses 16 through 19 present somewhat of a conundrum for the disciples. A little while, and you will see me no longer, and again a little while, you will see me. It doesn't make sense to them. What in the world is Jesus getting at? In a little while, you will not see me. In a little while, you will see me. They don't get it. And so they question among themselves. And of course, Jesus understands what they are questioning in their hearts. And so he brings it up. He asks them if this is what is going on. And there are a couple ways to look at this. One of which you probably got right away. In a little while, you won't see me. In a little while, you will. So it seems to point to the death and resurrection of Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet most of you got that part. And yeah, I would, and a lot of uh, scholars, you know, believe this is what Jesus was alluding to, but there's a couple other ways we could look at this. A couple other things that Jesus could have been talking about here, which I believe he was. Well, the, the second one, door number two, in a little while you won't see me, well, what is another moment when the disciples did no longer saw him? Well, we go to the ascension. Remember in the end of Luke, in the beginning of Acts, Jesus gives the final instructions and he ascends into heaven and they're looking up there, going, whoa, this is pretty cool. And also wondering, okay, what's going on? And the angel stand there, why are you looking up there like this? Don't you know that he will come back in the same way that he left? And so, the ascension and his second coming, you will see me. So that would seem to make sense. In a little while you won't see me, in a little while you will. But there's another way to consider what Jesus was saying here. Door number three would also be the ascension. In a little while you won't see me, but in a little while you will see me how? Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit, where our eyes will be open and we will understand what's going on. We'll see Jesus how we were supposed to see and we'll understand what Jesus did and why he did what he did. And so in a little while, you will see me, the Holy Spirit, coming into the lives of believers. And so scholars differ on this here. Well, I'll propose door number four and say it's all of the above. I think Jesus was talking about all three of those things. Of course, in that media context, death and resurrection, because he did talk about this a number of times with the disciples. He told them he was going to die and rise. They didn't understand that. But he was also alluding to the fact, because he also talked about 
sending the helper, the advocate, the Holy Spirit. And so, we get to verse 20. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. So, seems to be pointing to door number one there, death and resurrection. So, of course, they're going to be in sorrow. Jesus dies. They're sad. The world's rejoicing, thinking they've killed the cult leader. And so the, the Jews are happy. But that joy only lasts for a little while because as we see in John 20, verse 20, the text that we read a couple weeks ago, it says when the disciples, disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So they, their sorrow turned to joy very quickly when they saw Jesus. So seemingly to back up door number one, his death and resurrection. But there is more going on here and what happens here. So, verse 21 Jesus gives an example. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because of her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been brought into the world. So also your sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take that joy from you. So Jesus gives a practical illustration to explain this joy. Now I'm not going to say a whole lot about it because I'm not a woman and I've never given birth. I've heard childbirth is not pleasant. I've heard rumors that can be painful. I'm not going to say much about it. You women who have been through it, you know. But there is pain, but then Jesus says when that child comes, and from the women I've talked to, when that child is placed in your arms, there's joy, and that pain you don't remember. I'm seeing some heads nodding in agreement here. I can understand that. I mean, uh, the closest I get is when we went through our failed adoption, for that month and a half, there was great pain for Connie and I. And in the midst of that failed adoption, we even went through another failed adoption that very few people know about. We were connected, and we were going to have a phone call with the birth mother and our caseworker, and our caseworker gets on the line and says, she's changed her mind. It's like, seriously? In the midst of all this, pain on top of pain, we were wondering, is this going to happen? Are we going to be parents? We had lost a lot of money. I'm a pastor. I don't make that much money. I can't recoup all that. But then the phone call comes about Maya. And when, when she was placed in our arms for the first time, despite the fact she was screaming because she had blown out her diaper in the car seat, <laughs> and this guy who has never changed a diaper before, scared silly, there was still great joy over the fact that our daughter was here, that it actually happened. And the pain of the failed adoption was gone. We didn't dwell on that. We, we weren't sitting here looking at Maya going and crying over the baby we thought we were going to have. That doesn't make any sense. No, we weren't thinking about that. Our joy was over the fact that we were parents finally. And the same happened when we got Malachi. It was a great picture of the... the the family that was taking care of him for a couple of days was placing him in Connie's arms and just to see her face. I'm not sure where I was at. I was off camera someplace. I'm not sure why. But it, it, that joy that you saw, it was incredible. And this is what Jesus is starting to allude to here. Great joy will drown out sorrow and pain. It will drown that out when you experience that great joy. And you know what I'm talking about here. You, we may have pain and sorrow now, but great joy is coming that will drown that out. And this is what Jesus is getting at. This is the joy that's important to understand before we get into the following verses. You have to get that. If you forget about the joy that is to come, your prayers... You, you, become selfish. You become selfish in your prayers. If you forget that joy, you become selfish in your prayers. As we said, we want to find happiness. And so we start praying for what we want to be happy. But if we remember the joy that's coming, our prayers change. This is why the gospel needs to be proclaimed often. We forget 
we need to be reminded there is joy coming that it was going to overwhelm and overshadow any pain and sorrow we may be having now. Hearts will rejoice, he says. Remember what happened to Elizabeth when Mary walked into the room? John leapt in her womb with joy because Jesus was in, just in the room, present. Great joy when we're in the presence of Jesus and know what he is doing. Verse 23, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now what are we going, what's going on here? In that day, you will ask nothing. I mean, what, what day are we talking about? In that day. Well, when your eyes are open, when you, Pentecost, basically, when the Holy Spirit comes and opens your eyes to what's going on here. Why will we ask nothing of him then? Why won't we ask Jesus for, for whatever? Well, what's he getting at here? Well, that's described here in Matthew 27. And Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, a curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rock split. Why in the world did I read that verse? The curtain of the temple, what did that hide? It, it hid the holy of holies, Basically, the presence of God. When the curtain of the temple was torn in two, God was put on the loose, basically. Basically, people had access to that which they did not have access before. Before, only the, the high priest went back there, but only once a year. But now, everybody has access to God. God was on the loose. God was for everybody. Upon Jesus taking our sins to the cross, the curtain was torn, and so God uh, out there and we have that access. And, it's, and so we don't need that intercession. We have God. We can go to him. I mean, the death and resurrection meant forgiveness of sins and access. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, I will give it to you. Once again, another often misused and abused verse in the Bible. What does it mean to ask in Jesus' name? It's not, dear God, in Jesus' name, I want a new car. This is not magic, people. We get that. You can't just throw Jesus' name in there and expect to get whatever you want. It doesn't work that way. Maybe we've tried it before. When we are filled with the joy that only comes through the Holy Spirit, we're going to ask only according to God's will what he wants. We're asked only according to his will. I mean, if you're truly anticipating that awesome joy, why would you want to be selfish in your prayers? It doesn't make sense. Once again, we're not going to look at our children and mourn the loss of the child we lost a month and a half earlier. It doesn't make sense. It's not about us. It's about God's will. Thy will be done, not our will be done. If Jesus had not known the joy to come, he would not have prayed thy will be done. But he knew, and thus thy will be done. He knew the cross was coming. He knew the cross was going to hurt. And it's not like, dear God, you know something? I've heard about this cross thing. I've seen them. I don't think I want to do that. These people are just going to leave me. No, he knew what was coming. Thy will be done. He knew the joy. He knew the joy. And he will give it to you. God will give it to you. At 3 o'clock today, it will mark snack time in the family. And so it's usually 3 o'clock if the kids get up from naps earlier. Um, can we have a snack? Well, nope, not 3 o'clock yet. They under, kind of understand that. They'll, they still protest. Now let's say they come, and Maya gets up or Malachi gets up and they come downstairs and they say, Daddy, Mommy said I could have my whole bucket of Halloween candy from last year. Um, 
don't think so. Yes, we still have Halloween candy left. Even, even they, if they invoke mommy's name, I'm going to go, um, I'm going to go check with mommy first. And I probably don't even need to check. Now, if they said, Daddy, mommy said I could have some candy. Okay. I can kind of believe that. I'm still going to go up and ask her, did you really say that? Oh, yeah, I can have peace. Or, no, I did not say that. Or, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to... I get that. I'm, I'm not going to give that to them. But now, let's say they come downstairs and says, Daddy, Mommy said I could have some carrots and hummus for my snack. Okay. I'm going to be glad to give that. Maya has just discovered the joy of carrots and hummus, and that's an awesome snack. I'm going to give it to her every single day if she asks for it. Or, I can, Mommy said I can have strawberries or grapes. Yes, 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 you can have it all, and I will sit down with you and eat it with you. I'll be glad to give it when she asks that, because she's asking for what we want her to have that's going to be good for her. I mean, that, that's the sense here that we're getting at in this text. Asking in Jesus' name what is going to bring him glory. Until now, Jesus says, you have not, you, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Why? Because they, they're, they're still sorrowful. Holy Spirit hasn't come. They still have those selfish desires. Remember Peter tried to tell Jesus, no, 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 you're not going to die. That's not going to happen to you, that kind of stuff. No, they're being selfish because they don't know what's coming. They don't know the joy that is coming. They don't, get, they don't understand the plan yet. So they, have, they haven't asked anything in my name, he says. But ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Your joy is not truly full until you truly understand the end game of this life. That's where our joy comes in. It's not about having the most toys. It's not about having the best job. It's not about having the most successful kids or grandkids. Yeah, I really did say that. That's, that's true. It's not about being the most influential or whatever the case may be. When you truly understand that it's about Jesus, then you will ask for that which will glorify God. And when God gives you what you need to glorify God, your joy will be full to overflowing. And when you, that joy overflows, you will keep asking for that which will glorify God. I mean, do you see this gloriously beautiful, endless loop that's being created here? We'll keep asking, and we'll keep asking because of the joy that is happening here. That's, that is the end game, which is endless. The infinite loop, it keeps going and building and building. Until the Holy Spirit comes, you will ask nothing in Jesus' name. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will ask nothing of Jesus, but go straight to God in Jesus' name. That's the good news for sinners who have been cut off from God. We have access to the Father. We can go to him and talk to him and run to him like a child to their father or mother. That's awesome news. And so our prayer ought to be this. Oh God, draw me closer to you that I may know joy more and more and thus pray for that which brings you glory. That should be our prayer. May I know this joy more and more. Remind me of this. That I may not be selfish in my prayers, but seek to bring you glory. Pray that prayer until your joy is overflowing, and then pray it again and again, praising God always and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.